Hello everyone and welcome to a new lecture in the ACD course and today we are speaking about a strange topic that many of the doctors didn't hear about before or sometimes is easily missed in our clinical practice which is atrial infarction. Maybe slightly some weird to hear about atrial infarction. Our ILOs today are to understand the ACG features of atrial infarction and what's its clinical implication in the patients. Of course, we all speak about ventricles as the only chambers prone to infarction. When we speak about anterior STEMI, inferior STEMI, lateral STEMI, we speak about the corresponding walls of the left ventricle, and sometimes the patient may develop RV infarction, which we have spoken about before. But many of us forget the atria, which are chambers inside the heart, and they are prone to infarction. First of all, regarding the blood supply of the atria, Right atrium receives its blood supply from direct atrial branches from the RCA. They are named right anterior, right intermediate, and right posterior atrial branch, which originate directly from the RCA along its course in the right AV groove. Besides receiving deoxygenated blood from the systemic circulation via SVC and IVC, whereas the left atrium receives a blood supply from direct branch from the LCX named as left anterior, left intermediate, and left posterior atrial branch arising throughout the course of the LCX or directly from the OM branches, and also it receives oxygenated blood from the lungs via the pulmonary veins. So if we want to ask this question, which is more common, the right atrial infarction or the left atrial infarction? Of course, it is the right atrium because it receives less oxygenated blood than the left atrium. And in a paper published by Gordon and Singer, they reviewed several larger series and they concluded that right atrial infarction occurred in nearly 81 to 98 percent of infarction, left atrial infarction in 2 to 19 percent, and by atrial infarction in 90 to 24 percent of infarction. So, right atrial infarction is much more common than left atrial infarction. This paragraph was quoted from the ECE guidelines of the Force Universal Definition of MI in 2018. They mentioned that the ACG diagnosis of atrial infarction should be suspect in the context of ventricular infarction with transient elevation and reciprocal depressions of the PR segment rather than the ST segment as we see in STEMI, and they are usually associated with changes in the configuration of the P wave. So in the guidelines, they stated the clinical importance of diagnosis of atrial infarction in our clinical practice. The incidence of infarction usually occurs in up to 10% of patients with acute MI and almost all of the accompany ventricular infarction. So it is almost rare or slightly impossible to see isolated atrial infarction. Usually it occurs in the context of ventricular infarction as the culprit artery which resulted in ventricular infarction it can result as well in atrial infarction. Atrial infarction, of course, is suspected in case of PR segment deviations in the ACG, changes in the P wave morphology, or supraventricular arrhythmias like SVT, AF, or atrial flutter. So these are the conditions in the ECG in which you suspect that the patient has developed atrial infarction on top of the ventricular infarction. Let's see this ECG example here. Of course, as we know, the atrial infarction would result in affection of the atrial depolarization. So which part of the ACG would be affected? Of course, by logic, it would be the P wave, which represents atrial depolarization, followed by the PR segment. So these are the parts of the ACG to be affected in case of atrial infarction, and which we are going to speak about the criteria to diagnose atrial infarction, whereas the complex ST segment and T wave are not affected as a result of atrial infarction. They would be affected as a result of the ventricular infarction. Of course, another name or a terminology for PR segment, which is written in some literature, is PTA segment. So I just mentioned this terminology in order to be familiar with when we read in literature about atrial infarction. But in our video here, we are going to use the term of PR segment because, of course, it is much, much more common. And, of course, it is easily understood that the PR segment represents the straight segment between the end of the P wave and the start of the complex. Let's see this ECG here. This is the normal wave, the normal P wave, isoelectric PR segment, isoelectric ST segment, normal complex, normal T wave. And when we say isoelectric, of course, we compare it to the TP segment. Let's see an example of atrial infarction. 
Here we can see that the P wave has a change in morphology, it is M shade, and the PR segment is slightly elevated in comparison with the TP segment. So here we are speaking about an ECG features query for atrial infarction. Another example we can see here low amplitude and slightly irregular shape of P wave with PR segment depression. Of course, it is suspicious of atrial infarction. Another example, inverted P wave with PR segment elevation, of course suggestive. And here we can see flattened P wave or in some cases it may be disappearing at all with PR segment depression. So we are speaking about ECG features suggestive of atrial infarction. There were ECG diagnostic criteria for atrial infarction that were released by Leo et al. And they mentioned some major and minor criteria to diagnose atrial infarction. The first major criteria in which PR segment elevation more than 0.5 mm in V5 and V6 and in other literature it was in V3 to V6 with reciprocal depression of PR in V1 and V2. Another one, elevation of the PR segment more than 0.5 mm in lead 1 with reciprocal depression in leads 2 or 3. Then there is another criterion which is PR segment depression of more than 1.5 mm in all precordial leads and more than 1.2 mm in lead 1, 2 and 3 plus minus any form of atrial arrhythmia that may accompany these ECG criteria. So presence of one of them, of course, such as the presence of atrial infarction in or as well as a ventricular infarction. Minor criteria which are not enough to diagnose atrial infarction are abnormal P wave morphology like M shape, W shape, irregular or notched shape or sometimes flattened, and depression of the PR segment of small amplitude without accompanying PR elevation. These criteria alone are not enough to diagnose atrial infarction without major criteria. So these were the criteria proposed by Leo et al. regarding diagnosis of atrial infarction by ECG. Let's see this ECG example here. We can see here that the patient is having PR segment depression in lead 1, 2, 3 and also in V4 and there is reciprocal PR segment elevation in V1 and EVR. So we are speaking here about ECG criteria suggestive of atrial infarction. Mostly it is right atrial infarction and we are going to say why it is right atrium next in the lecture. So this is an example of atrial infarction as we see in here due to the PR segment deviation and so remember the presence of PR segment deviation of depression and elevation and they are reciprocal changes occurring in the same patient plus minus abnormal P wave morphology in patient with MI indicate presence of concomitant atrial ischemia or even infarction so pay attention to these ECG criteria of course, there is an important question that comes to our minds regarding the localization of atrial infarction. The question is, can the distribution and polarity of PR segment deviation localize the atrial infarction? The answer is, yes, it can help. Let's see an example. Infarction on the right atrium, which is of course an anterolateral chamber located towards the right side, would result in PR elevation in lead 1 AVL plus minus in V1 and AVR because the direction of the wave of injury is more towards the anterior leads and the lateral leads, whereas it will result in reciprocal depression in lead 2 and 3. Of course, right atrial infarction is more common and it usually accompanies inferior STEMI. Whereas in case of infarction of the left atrium, it would show PR elevation lead 2 and 3 because left atrium is a posterior chamber and basal and towards the left side much more. So the wave of injury would be directed towards the inferior leads resulting in PR elevation in lead 2 and 3 and reciprocal depression in lead 1 and AVL as the wave of injury is directed away from their positive poles. And usually it accompanies anterior STEMI based that the left atrium receives plus supply from branches from the LAD. So the priority and distribution of PR deviation may help to localize which atrium is affected. Let's see what are the supraventricular arrhythmias that can occur in atrial infarction. PECs, which can be very frequent in case this atrial infarction on top of the sinus rhythm. Wandering atrial pacemaker, which is continuous change of the P wave morphology and the heart rate still below 100 P per minute. Atrial fibrillation, of course, is the most clinically significant arrhythmia that can occur in these patients. Atrial flutter is very important to note and atrial tachycardia, of course, is one of the supraventricular arrhythmias that can occur in atrial 
in future. Another question that of course force itself upon our minds. Does the presence of atrial infarction affect the clinical risk of an MI patient? Of course it does and that's why we have dedicated a lecture for atrial infarction. The presence of concomitant atrial infarction in an MI patient increases the risk of atrial tachyarrhythmias which may worsen the hemodynamics of the patient. Risk of thromboembolism especially in presence of atrial fibrillation which can be systemic or pulmonary according to which atrium is affected and one of the famous complications for example in case of left atrial infarction complicated by AF is left atrial thromboembolism resulting in stroke. Free atrial wall rupture which sometimes may occur especially in right atrial infarction because of its thinner wall in comparison with the left atrium and loss of atrial cac due to loss of the contractile power of the atrium resulting in weakness of the atrial cac and reduced ventricular filling during diastole. So these are the clinical outcomes that may occur due to atrial infarction which signifies that the atrial infarction of course increases the clinical risk and worsens the prognosis of an MI patient in comparison with a patient without atrial infarction. And one of the famous clinical outcomes of atrial infarction of course is atrial fibrillation and whenever we see AF in a patient with MI we suspect atrial infarction. Atrial fibrillation, of course, is caused by presence of a trigger and a substrate. A trigger that induces AF like an ectopic focus that discharges impulse at high rates and a substrate that maintains AF like in this example the atrium myocardium which has varying conduction velocity and refractiveness resulting in multiple wavelet re-entries. So atrial fibrillation needs both a trigger and a substrate. And acute MI can cause AF by two famous mechanisms. The first one is the atrial infarction which can lead to a substrate substrate that is liable to perpetuation of the atrial fibrillation and the increased LV and diastolic pressure in case of extensive infarction resulting in increased left atrial pressure which can be a trigger that induces AF in presence of a substrate. And of course the ACG features of atrial fibrillation that we all know as the absence of persistent P wave replaced by the fibrolateral waves either coarse or fine waves irregular irregularity and it related to about 400 to 600 beat per minute due to the extremely chaotic atrial activity. So let's see this ECG example here. We can see here a clear evidence of atrial fibrillation by absence of persistent P waves with S2 depression here in V1, 2, 3 and 4 suggestive of myocardial ischemia and so we are having here atrial infarctions that may be caused by non ST elevation acute coronary syndrome. Here another example of a patient with atrial fibrillation with extremely rapid ventricular rate and recent evidence of ST elevation here that is clear in V2, 3, 4, 5 and so it is an evidence of anterior STEMI complicated by atrial infarction. And of course the AF in the context of non-ST elevation syndrome or STEMI is independently associated with increased mortality because it is correlated with increased size of the MI as a cause of the AF because it may signify increased left ventricular and varsal pressure due to the extensive infarction resulting in increased left atrial pressure and increased risk of thromboembolism as a result of AF and atrial thrombosis which may result in stroke, acute lower limb ischemia and so AF in a patient with acute coronary syndrome signifies worse prognosis in comparison to patient with acute coronary syndrome without atrial fibrillation. Another question that I think many of you have asked themselves why don't I say that this ECG is acute pericarditis rather than atrial infarction? Of course we all know that the PR segment deviation is a characteristic finding in pericarditis so how can I differentiate? In pericarditis there is widespread concave ST elevation associated with PR depression so it is a hallmark sign of widespread ST elevation PR depression except the knuckle sign in AVR plus minus V1 which is ST depression and PR elevation. So in pericarditis I would see uniform ST elevation and uniform PR depression except in AVR. Whereas in atrial infarction it is completely different. 
As uterine function is more common in STEMI than in non-STEMI, so I would see ST elevation limited to specific territory with reciprocal ST depression. For example, the patient is having inferior STEMI, so I would see ST elevation inferior leads only and reciprocal depression in one AVL, associated with right atrial infarction, which would be reflected on the PR segment. So first of all, the ST elevation here is not widespread. It is limited to a territory. Then I would not see uniform PR depression as in pericarditis. I would see PR depression and reciprocal PR elevation in specific leads according to which atrium is involved. So in this example, the patient was having inferior STEMI. So here the right atrial is affected. And so I would see PR depression in lead 2, 3 AVF and PR elevation in 1 AVL and also maybe in V1 and AVR. So it is not widespread PR depression, but it is PR depression and PR elevation according to which atrium is affected. So the changes of the ST segment and the PR segment in atrial infarction is not widespread as an acute pericarditis. It is limited to specific territory according to which culprit artery and which atrium is affected. Let's see this ACG example here. We can see here widespread PR segment depression in lead 1, 2, AVF and also from V2 to V6 associated with widespread ST segment elevation. And there is, of course, a knuckle sign, which is PR segment elevation and ST segment depression in AVR and slightly in V1. So here we are speaking about pericarditis rather than atrial infarction. The ST elevation is widespread, not limited to specific vascular territory. And also the PR depression is uniform with only PR elevation AVR. So it is not typical of atrial infarction. And near the end of our lecture, we need to remember that atrial infarction adds to the clinical burden of MI and that's why it is important to diagnose it and differentiate it from other pathologies. And so we understood today what are the ATG features of atrial infarction and what is the clinical implications of this pathology to the MI patients. And our take home message that right and left atria are cornerstone cardiac chambers amenable to infarction in STEMI and in non-STEMI, and also the presence of atrial infarction more than the clinical prognosis of MI and indicates higher risk. Thank you very much for you watching.